Greetings, one and all. Welcome to another dev stream of um, Sentinels of Earth Prime. Uh, I'm just going to show my display here for a second uh, because the Kickstarter is there. Uh, so uh, we are in the middle of the Sentinels of Earth Prime digital Kickstarter project, and we have funded and we're looking to get to stretch goals. So if you have not uh, found your way to the Kickstarter project yet, please visit the link, we'll post it in the chat, and check it out. Here's the link. I am John, aka Migrant P, uh, lead developer at Handlever Games, and uh, today I am joined by our newest Handelabrat, Campbell Giffen. Hello, Campbell. Hello, I am Campbell. I'm here for the internship for the summer working on earth prime yeah it's been great to have you over the summer uh have you enjoyed the experience so far um i've been loving it uh it's my first ever like real job you say so just finished my second year in school in computer science so i've really enjoyed everything i've done here just programming game really cool <laughs> awesome you looking forward to going back to school this fall uh, somewhat, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't mind staying in the summer, but yeah, <laughs> we'll probably back eventually. that's true. Uh, yeah, but it's been great to have you. Uh, and as you'll see here, uh, as you watch this stream, Campbell has done, uh, certainly the lion's share of programming for the engine side of earth prime. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, you've come a long way from your first dipping your toes into Bowman was your first was your Bowman the first one you programmed, or was it, was it Captain kind of, Thunder? Kind yeah. Kind of, uh, I mean, this nostalgia here. So I yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, I guess without further ado, uh, we're just mostly going to show today, I think, uh, most everything in the core game has been programmed. And so it's more sort of showing as opposed to doing today. Uh, but I think that will still be good. And Campbell, you can take it away and start showing off what you've been up to. Awesome. So. We're going to start off with a deck list here. So that's pretty much what you're going to be doing before you actually start programming the cards. So deck list is a JSON file here. And as you can see here, this is Captain Thunders. And it's going to be showing a lot of the stuff, like a lot of the text that you actually see on the card. Everything from like the hero name to the powers. And then the icons that actually uh, show it are right here as well. So you have the hit points. This is just a, um, a character card here for Captain Thunder. It's got a bunch of different stuff. It's just pretty much a text, pretty straightforward. Just getting it from like a document and putting it over here to show a visual of the text on the card. And then you go down to the cards here. It's just kind of the same type of thing, except it's for the cards. You also have to get your count here. Um, and then the ones that don't have powers just have like the body icon here with everything. And then, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. And also it's all the flavor uh, quotes and flavor references with the text. So the deck list is pretty much just all the text you'll be seeing on the cards. Pretty straightforward there. So after you make the deck list. Yeah, too bad get... that the computer can't just be like, hey, now I understand how to program the card. <laughs> yeah, just put this in and then everything's good to go. Yeah. <laughs> Some people are like, oh, yeah, just put a JPEG of the card. That's all you need to do, right? <laughs> yeah, imagine. <laughs> so after you do the deck list, you're going to have to actually program the card. Like John said, you actually have to do it. It's not going to do it for you. So I started with Captain Thunder. So this is one of the first cards that I personally programmed. So um, I use a lot of um, references from other cards from Sentinels of the Multiverse. Uh, there's a lot of helpful stuff. And there is a lot of helpful helper methods that I use that were made from John and John Mark for the old Sentinels games. So starting off with Thunderclap. This is the card controller for that card here. So this card is an ongoing, and the first time Captain Thunder deals lightning damage each turn, he deals one target, one sonic damage as well. So looking at this card here, we have to have, uh, we go to our public override add triggers here, which is going to be a trigger because um, it's going to be the first time he's dealing damage. So we're going to have to call a trigger right here, and it's going to be deal damage action, which is a game action here. And... Um, we have our logic here showing what needs to happen, what needs to be true for this trigger to trigger, essentially. 
And then we go into our method here where we're going to actually be putting the code for after it triggers. And then we have to also supply the trigger type. And then the trigger timing is also really important as it has to happen after the damage, not before. So this one's a little different because it's the first time Captain Thunder deals lightning damage each turn. So we have to add this um, bunch of couple different things here. The add after leaves play action here, where we're resetting the flag. Just pretty much making sure that it's only the first time for each turn and making sure that it resets after each turn goes on. So we have to put a string up here for the first time damage, adding this here, and then also uh, set um, card property is true that it did happen for the first time each turn. And then once we get into our method here, after the trigger happens, we go and then we actually do the damage. So we got a helper method here that just select targets and deals the damage. So we're just pretty much, this is just getting Captain Thunder to deal one target, one sonic damage. And then we also have to pass in like if it's optional or not. And this one is not optional because he does deal the damage. You don't have a choice. And then we go through our code routines here after, after we use this helper method. And then that is pretty much it for this first card, I guess. Cool. Yeah, and we also uh, we have a, do have a special string on this, so if you like right-click the card in the game, it will show you whether or not that's happened yet. So that's there on line so, twenty. Yeah. Yes, a bunch of different special strings where you see that it comes up here. Okay, moving on, we got another hero card here, and it's going to be a Doctor Metropolis card. So this one is going to be a little bit different than a normal card because we'll be using a base class here. It's going to be an abstract class, um, so we can go over to that here. So for Dr. Metropolis, there's a lot of um, location cards that are going to be doing the exact same stuff. So to make our lives easier programming, we make a base class here that we can call on all of the location cards that do this certain thing. I'm pretty sure all the location cards um, deal themselves damage at the end. So we use this for every single location card for Metropolis. So it's an abstract class here and then it all has they all have an end of turn trigger and then all of them have do a their certain thing whatever the specific card actually does and then at the end of the turn we can just call our deal damage helper here and that deals itself one damage so when we go back to lamplight lasso here we can see that we are not just calling a regular card controller there we're actually calling the dr metropolis location card controller which accesses that there and then we um, override that location effect right here. And then we do um, what the card does. So the card wants to select one target with five or fewer HP. And then until the start of your turn, that target cannot deal damage. And then this card deals itself one melee damage, which you don't see here because we already um, we already cover that in the uh, abstract class there. Mm -hmm. So we don't even have to cover that, which is very helpful when you're making a bunch of different cards and they're doing the same kind of thing. So this card here, Pretty straightforward stuff. We're just selecting a target. We're going to store that in stored results here. And then we're using one of the many helper, helper methods to select cards and store results. And then we have to make sure um, we have the link card criteria here, which is just going over the criteria for the card. So we're making sure we only get to choose from a card that's in play, a target, and the po hit points are less or equal to five. And then we store the results and then we come in down here. And then this time we're adding a status effect which is gonna be a little different from the triggers. So status effect is something that's gonna be like, you can only do it one time or till the end of the turn. So we're gonna um, get our selected card here after we do our check to make sure it's not null, we did select a card. And then we are gonna pass it um, to the status effect and then set the criteria that it's that card and then make sure it's until the next turn here by passing it um, to the, to the start of the next turn of this turn taker. And then we're going to put it in our I enumerator there and then pass it through the coroutines per usual. So that's a look at that card there for Dr. Metropolis. We do use this, I believe, in a couple other cards here. I show you for the abstract classes, with the base classes, which are very neat and helpful. All right. We'll go through another hero card for you guys. We go over stealthy form. Excuse me. All right, so this is a pseudo card. Um, when this card enters play, discard the top card of one deck, then destroy each shape other than this one. And then the first time pseudo will be dealt damage each turn, you may redirect that damage to another hero target. If you do, increase the damage dealt by pseudo by one. So we got a couple different things going on here. 
We also have our base class here, which I did not click. Oh, and it's over here. Anyways, it's the same type of thing as before. We have our shape uh, card controller, just like the Dr. Metropolis location uh, con uh, card controller there. So we're calling that instead because there's shapes that um, destroy all other shapes um, at the end of what destroy each shape other than this one um, after it enters play. So before that, though, we'll be getting a deal damage action trigger here. So it's the first time uh, damage taken this turn. So we're going back to the thing we had on Thunderclap as well, making sure it only happens the first time with our string up here. And then we have to set the card property true if it's real. Just kind of solidifying that it only happens um, uh, the first time pseudo deals damage each turn. And then we have our normal logic here that we just go in the deal damage action, deal damage for the add trigger. And then we go into the method here that we call after this has been checked and make sure everything is true here. Also checking that it is redirectable in case it's not, then it's not worth going in here just to redirect something that can't be redirected to. So just as before, we're going to take a stored results just to get, um, so we have that card that has selected. So we get to choose the target that we're going to redirect. This is a helper method as well that it selects the card and redirects the damage for you. So all you have to do is uh, select a card. It's going to be the hero take return controller, make sure it's a hero, and then it will redirect the damage to that card. And then for this one, we also want to store the results because we're also checking after. If we did, we want to increase the next damage dealt by pseudo by one. So we're doing our check here. We did select card, another helper method just to make sure that it's not null and you did select a card. And this one's going to be like the last one. It's going to be a, st a status effect. It's going to be a little different because it's not going to be until the end of the next turn, but you still use your status effects when it's going to be um, the number of uses, just one. So you can set it to the number of uses. So this only happens once. It's not like a trigger where it's going to be uh, happening as long as uh, such card is in the game. So that's why status effects are a little different because it's going to be to the end of turns. And also you can also use it here with this example, um, just like for the first time. So after pseudo um, deals his next damage, this will go away and the status effect will go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those effects can stick around. Like, even if this stealthy form goes away, that status effect can still be around until yeah, it gets used up, so. Also yeah. true. So it's a little bit different than the triggers. If the card goes away, the trigger will be gone, but then these status effects can stay as long as after they're implemented and the, the thing that happens hasn't happened yet. And then we go down here, because this is an abstract class, we're calling on the shape effect. So for the shapes, like I said, they do their thing, which when they enters play, and this one's going to be discarding the top card of one deck, then destroy each shape other than this one. So destroying each shape other than this one you don't see here because that's in the uh, abstract class, the base class for all the um, shapes for pseudo. So we'll just be looking at the discarding the top card of one deck. So we'll just be selecting a deck. Uh, we'll also have to store our results because we're going to have to discard the, the top card of that deck after we choose it. So we're just going through another simple helper method here, looking at all the decks. Um, you can choose any deck here, so that's why we have our um, function set to true to be looking at any deck. And then also the selection types here that we use just to show uh, in the UI, it's gonna be like, oh, select a deck to discard the top, ca top card from. So these are really important too for viewing in the UI. Um, and then after that, we use did select location, which is the same thing as like did select card. It's just a check to make sure we actually did select something and that's not null. So then we can go in and access it so it's not null. And then we get the location here. And then we're just discarding the top card here using another helper method, discard top card, and then going through our uh, co-routines per usual there. So that's another hero card controller there for pseudo, which cool. is kind of a bunch of different stuff yeah it almost combines the last two cards yeah in, exactly like, it's the first time each turn but then also like using a subclass and everything yeah so a lot of stuff connected together making my job a little easier sometimes so using other cards as examples and stuff like that cool all right so now we're going to look at an environment card so we got couple of new environments in Earth Prime, and then we'll be looking at the card Fireside City. This one's Lunar Unrest. It's not too confusing here. 
So it's going to have a lot of the environments that are going to use a lot of triggers because there's a lot of at the start of the turns and at the end of the turns. So this one, um, at the end of the environment turn, play the top card of the environment deck, which is very straightforward. We have our end of turn triggers, which we're going to be seeing a lot of. Um, just a trigger that goes off at the end of their turn. And then we have this helper method here that just plays the top card of the environment deck. So this will play the top card, put top card of the environment deck, and then it's going to play the message response as well. So like um, Lunar Unrest play the top card of the environment deck. Yeah, and that's a built-in thing, so we don't even have to program it here. You can just oh. say, use that. It's very common for something to say at the start of the turn, play the top card, or at the end of the turn, play the top card, or whatever. So Yeah, exactly. So this one actually has end of the turn and the start of the turn trigger here. So as I said, there's a lot of start and end of the turn triggers for the environment cards. So for this one, at the end of the environment turn, this one's a little different, not too common for the cards. It's looking for another card in the game. So this one's looking to see if Lady Lunar is in play. So we have our string up here to make it look a little cleaner. We're gonna assign it to a variable here, Lady Lunar Identifier. So we're not just passing in a bunch of strings down here. So we gotta check first before we go into our code here. So if Lady Lunar is in play, she deals each hero target to uh, psychic damage. So this if statement here is just checking if this card is in play and not under a card using one of the helper methods as well. And we're just gonna be passing it in our string here. And then once we get in this string, we are not done yet because we have to actually find that card. So we know it's in play, but we don't actually have the card yet. And this and Lady Lunar is gonna be the one that's actually da dealing damage. So once we call on our string again, so we have that variable there, and then we're just gonna find the card. So we're gonna get that Lady Lunar card that's in play by using the spine card. And then we're just gonna deal our classic damage here, except the, the damage source, or the card source, sorry, will be this variable Lady, which is Lady Lunar. So then, and then we're just gonna all pass it into these, oh, and then sorry, then we do uh, the destroy right here, which is just destroying this card, which is just a simple, method here, which just destroys um, whatever card you choose. And this is gonna be um, this card after Lady Lunar does her damage. And then we're just gonna pass in our code routines. It's another way to do it, just passing it like this, which will just steal the damage and then destroy it first. Just, sorry, deal the damage first, then destroy the card. Good stuff. So, that is an environment card, which is just a little different than a couple of the other ones, but all very similar in together. So, now we're going to go to a villain card known as Forbidden Knowledge. So this card is one of Hades' cards, who's actually the first villain that I programmed. So this one is also using one of those uh, one of those base classes, those abstract classes. So the soul packs are kind of interesting. You got um, you have to put it into an active hero's play area. So this is taking, um, we're using this for all of the soul pack cards that go in because they're all being put into a uh, hero's play area right at the start. So we're gonna have to put this determined play location in our um, soul pack card controller here. And then pretty much we're just selecting a hero turn taker. That's gonna be the place, the play area where we put this card. So this happens for every single soul pack. We're gonna store our results here per usual when we're selecting something. And then we're gonna select that hero turn taker um, making sure that it is a hero turn taker and then putting them in their play area for future reference when we get back to the uh, Forbidden Knowledge card. Um, so we're just putting the move card to the destination in there, making sure we get the hero that we did um, select and then putting that card there. And then all of the um, soul pack cards are going to have when they're destroyed. So we're going to have the add destroyed trigger right here so we don't have to worry about that back on the cards. And then we even have our um, we have our method here that we're going to be able to return soul pack effect, which we go back to here. We can see that we use it right here. We'll get to that in a second. So so these um, this override play method here is going to be used for one shots mostly, but also cards like this where like right when it goes into play, it's doing something right away. So this card is going to be going into your hero play area as the soul pad card controller did for us. That's why we're calling it there. And then when it gets put in that play area, it's throwing all the soul pad cards to be doing different things. So this one we're going to get making sure we so we don't actually know where it is right now. So we have to call that here, making a variable. So like we know where it is, but we don't like this code right here doesn't know yet. 
So we have to get the store hero variable, and then we have to get the location of this card. We got the owner turn taker, and then we have to set them to. We have to get the hero uh, turn taker controller of this um, location. So then we get that player to draw ten cards. So using all that, we get um, we get the hero, and then we're gonna make them draw ten cards, which is the plain draw cards helper method here. And then after that, they're just gonna discard five cards, which is pretty straightforward here. So that's what the play um, method does there. And then we're gonna go to our call here on the abstract class that we use from the soul pack card controller. And then this is gonna be on the destroy card action because it is after the card is destroyed, which was done all over in the soul pack card controller there. And then, so this specific one is going to, um, a hero character in the play area deals himself five psychic damage. And then that player shuffles their hand into their deck and draws one card. So right here, we're going to have to go back and also do what we did in the play. We're going to have to get the hero and then we're going to get another store results and we're going to select card and store results here. Um, so we're selecting a hero character in this play area to deal themselves five psychic damage because I believe there can be more than one hero character in play areas. Yeah, with, so the, with the Sentinels hero yeah. from the multiverse. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. We have to make sure we're looking at different edge cases. Stuff. So there's going to be multiple. There could possibly be multiple hero cards. So we're going to have to make sure we go through this and then we're selecting a hero character card if there is multiple of them. So then after we do that, we go through some logic here, making sure it's in game and we're making sure it is in the play area of this hero. So you're not just getting any type of hero. Um, after we pass our code routine for that, we're going to go and get that hero. We're going to get the selected hero. Go in the first or default here. It's just taking the um, hero that we did select. Um, and we're making sure doing our, always be doing our checks before we actually use it because we don't want to get any null references. And then we're just going to be using another a new method that we see here is a deal damage to self method. Just the helper method here. It should be dealing, as it says, dealing damage to themselves. And this one's pretty vicious here. Five damage, <laughs> psychic damage. Um, so yeah, so then you're just making sure you get that hero, you're selecting one because there can be multiple of them. And then we're going to pass a code routine per usual. And then that player shuffles their hand into their deck and draws one card. So we also, we actually have a helper method here, which is shuffle cards into location, which is nice. So we take that hero that we already selected and then we take their whole hand, we shuffle it all into their deck. So getting rid of all the cards they've just drawn. So that's also pretty detrimental. Yeah. And then we finish. Soul yeah. packs have uh, good benefits, but also big drawbacks if they get destroyed. Yeah. At the risk reward with them. And then after you do that, it gives you one extra card, which is nice of them. Uh, so we just pass in another helper method here, um, game controller, and then we're just drawing one card for this uh, for that hero turn taker that uh, ended up dealing himself damage, and then shuffling their hand into their deck into their deck. Yes. So that is Hades uh, Forbidden Knowledge card. That was one was a little bit that was my first hero so that was this one was a lot for me definitely needed some help from john on this one yeah yeah but you uh now you're an expert you yeah, exactly. you programmed argo pretty quickly <laughs> yeah, this, this one was months ago yeah 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 it came a long way so now we're gonna be looking at the character card which are big parts of the game so this is daedalus's variant card which is daedalus at the forge character card controller so there's two different parts to the character cards, pretty much the front and the back. So the back is going to be the incapacitated abilities here. Look perfect for a switch case because there's going to be three options for the incaps. So we're going to be looking at each one with a case. So you pretty much just select if you want to use this one, this one, or this one, and then we just code whatever each one says. Most of the time, they're pretty straightforward. Like, as example, destroy one ongoing. We just get a lot of helper methods for these ones. A lot of them are used multiple times. Like, there'll be a lot of destroy one ongoings for different uh, different heroes. Just like a lot of reuse stuff. So pretty much just selecting a card to destroy, passing in our card criteria, just pretty much putting everything in the helper method here. And then this is actually one of the, there's not a lot of them like this. We're gonna reveal the top card of one deck and then we're going to put it into play or into its trash. So then we actually have to, like we, you've seen before, get our store results. 
making sure we select a deck. Um, and then we're going to also come down here, do our standard check of did select deck to make sure we do have a uh, deck and it's not null. And then now we're going to use another helper method. There's a lot of like a reveal cards, play it or discard it, a bunch of stuff like that. So this one we're going to be using reveal card, play it or discard it, like I said. And then we can put it to play or put it into a strash. So all this is doing is passing in who the, uh, what the pretty much what deck we're going to be um, using and then we're going to reveal the top card and then it's going to ask to play it or discard it so then if it's discarded it goes to its trash so this works very perfectly for what we had here and then pretty standard there we end up passing the coroutines and that's that for that and then like i said a lot of these are very straightforward so this one is one player draws one card um, and then we select hero to draw a card as you can see here which is the Another helper method that's used a lot, which is just taking in uh, the hero, and then it's just pretty much selecting one hero, and then they draw one card for their deck. Yeah, for the and, for the second one, it's kind of interesting because I noticed in that in that helper method it says, "Is it discard?" False, because the text of it says, "Put it into play or into its trash," instead of "Put it into play or discard it." Right? Like it's not actually being discarded. It's kind of a weird wording thing. Right, yeah. These things so, come yeah. up sometimes. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of weird things that come up. It's like, oh, it's not like the other ones that we've seen before. The wording's just a little bit different, so we have to kind of treat it a little bit differently, as John just mentioned there, as it's discarded. It's not discarded technically, it's put into the trash. Yeah. So, weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very weird. So the second part of all the hero character cards that you see are gonna be the powers. And the powers are gonna be a little different because of our friend guys. <laughs> uh, we're gonna be needing to get power numerals. So pretty much what this is, is just, so if I, if you did this and then um, select decks and just passed in. So the reason we actually select decks, we're not selecting a deck. So we'll read this here, sorry. It goes reveal the top two cards of one deck, discard one and put the other back on top of its deck. So they're wondering why are we selecting decks here when there's it just says select one because guys can change the number of anything on this card. So that's why we have to store each one in a variable here. And then we're getting the power numeral, which is pretty much just making it available to change if it has to be changed. And then we're passing the expected value and the index of it. So we got zero, one, two, which is the first one, the second one, and the third one. And we're just passing the values in there so it can change if possible. So it changes up a lot of stuff for powers because we're gonna have to always keep that in consideration. And then even if it doesn't happen much, we still have to be aware of it. And then making sure we use this instead of actually just passing in the one deck or the discard one card, we also got to make sure we put it in this because of the possibility of it changing. So with that being said there, we're just going to go through a stored results um, of select location decision because we're selecting a deck. And then it's like, instead of selecting a deck, we select decks and we're going to pass in our number of decks. So most of the time, this is end up going to give us one deck. But for the times that it doesn't, we have to be aware of that. So that's why we're using a for each down here. Um, so a lot of the time it's going to go through go through this once here because it just chooses one deck. But in the scenario that it does use more than one deck, we have to go through it multiple times. So we're going to get all of our decks that we chose, which is most of the time one, but it can be more. So and then for each deck in decks, um, we're going to use another helper method here. Um, so reveal cards, select some, move them, and then return the rest. So this is one we actually just made for Daedalus, I believe. And then it's also used for something yeah, else. Yeah, we added some extra, extra yes. properties to the, to the method call. Yeah. So. Or extra parameters, that is. Yeah. So, exact, so we have to pass in the number of the reveals and number of discards, like I said, because of the applied numerology. So it's gonna, this one is... Being like if it's you see the booleans down there we have right here you can see that's we're passing in uh can put into hand false can play card false can put into play false and then it's discard card is true so all the ones that we select um we're going to be discarding and then ones that we don't are going to be returned so real top two cards of one card discard one and then put the other on top of its deck so with this we're just selecting one to discard and the other one gets put on back of the deck so yeah so a lot of different stuff happens with the powers because of guys pretty much so we have to be very careful using that 
and it makes for a lot of yeah. extra code sometimes. So you could also be revealing three cards and discarding one, or revealing two cards and discarding zero, or revealing two cards and discarding two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of different cases that can happen that so we have to be prepared for each one of them pretty much. So that's why we, we do this. Cool. So that's a little bit a taste of the character cards. And then we can look at the villain character card too, which is just a whole nother beast. Mm -hmm. so these are quite a bit. So this isn't exactly what it is. This is this what you see on the card. You see the setup. So we have to take the turn taker controller is pretty much what the setup is. And all this is, is pretty much putting the cards in to play or whatever the setup says for the game. So a lot of it's just gonna be putting cards into play as you can see here. So like at the start of the game, he enters um, or the tournament side up and then cards are revealed from the top of the deck until X amount of minions, X amount of breaches are revealed and put into play and are shuffled back in the deck. So all the um, turn taker controller is doing is just setting up the game. And then we just use our calls here about putting cards into play, making sure we have the right criteria there. And then, so then before the game starts, before you actually do anything, it'll be all set up because of this helpful guy, turn taker controller. And then where all the code comes from on the villain uh, character card is actually here. So it's all put together. It's like a couple cards in one in code wise. So, yeah, because there's two sides, right? Yeah. yeah, there's two sides. And also even on one side, there's gonna be more than like you see on a normal card with a bunch of different calls. And then also you have the advanced. So the advanced adds a couple other things as well. So tackling this Omega. You actually see a lot of, there's a lot of special strings usually shown for these because they're doing a lot of damage to like the hero target with the most uh, HP and stuff like that. But this one actually doesn't have too much. So, um, so here we go. So we're going to, this is just storing this for future. We'll go back. We'll see this many times throughout the code, just the integer number of breaches and we're making sure it's dynamic. So it's always updated and we always have the amount of breaches that are in play just to be called in future code that we see. And then one thing on Omega here is we see on his front, um, it says, uh, Omega is indestructible. Yeah. Oh yeah, if there are any breaches in play, Omega is indestructible. Sorry, I couldn't find that there. Um, so we see this here, it's gonna be a bool here to see if its card is indestructible. And then we have this up here in the constructor as well making sure that it gets that it's indestructible. So we just have a simple if statement here, checking for all the checks. It says, if there are any breaches in play, Omega is indestructible. So pretty much it's just unable to like die, I guess. Yeah. At what indestructible is. Um, so it's just like a simple Boolean we pass in here and then we make sure we have this in there as well um, to make it indestructible when we, we already call in here, number of breaches. And we see if there's any breaches in play, um, Omega is indestructible. So it's just a simple Boolean. We can see here, there's a couple cards like this that we need to ask if it's indestructible. And then there's a lot of triggers for um, for the villain cards. So we have different sections here, pretty much. Um, we separate them by if statements. We have the um, if it's not flipped. So this is like the, everything that's happening on the front. Um, and then we also split it up to the advanced part as well because we have to check because the stuff in advance is not going to be happening when it's not advanced. So we have all of the code that's happening when the game is advanced. And then we have our else here. So this checks if the card is flipped, if the card isn't flipped, sorry. And then this is checking else. So when the card is flipped. So this is going over everything that is happening on the backside. And then this is always, if he has less or equal to zero HP, the game is over. So we gotta make sure we put that in, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that came up when I was testing. <laughs> yeah, I would test because John actually defeated Omega, but didn't defeat Omega because we forgot. To, well, I forgot to put that in, so that's why we do our testing to make sure everything is okay. And that'd be very disappointing if you do all that work to defeat Omega and then you don't even get the winning animation. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we're gonna have a start of a villain call here. So we're, as you've seen before already, we have our triggers. We're going to add start of turn trigger, and then we're going to be calling this method here, start of villain response. So this one is at the start of the turn, we're going to check, see if there are six breaches to play. So we're going to go back to here, call our integer that we stored up there, 
and if there's six of them in play, the game is over. Omega wins. I should so, probably yeah. check if it's greater than or equal to six, actually. Yeah. It, is, it doesn't need to be e exactly six. It should be greater or equal to six. Okay, cool. The wording's... Okay, okay, yeah, sure. that's Christopher's yeah. wording is usually like, he'll say if there's 10, then yeah, there are also six and then four more. <laughs> oh, gotcha. So yeah. If there are... <laughs> Boom. Please yeah. fix that stream live for you guys. Um, so yeah, at the start of the turn, if there are six breaches in play, which I guess also means six or greater, six or more. Um, Omega wins, game over. So it's a little different ways so we have to pass in our message here. Uh, it's a different way that Omega um, can win. So we put in this this string here, and then we're going to be sending the message. And then we have our game over uh, helper method that we call here. And it's an alternate defeat because it's not just him getting less or equal to zero HP. It's another way that Omega can win. Um, and then we have our otherwise, which is going to be... Um, if there are two or fewer villain targets in play, Omega flips, but then we also have to make sure Omega flips only once each villain turn, and that's going to be happening throughout the whole game. So what we do for that is we have a journal where it pretty much like, like, um, records everything that's happening. So we have to, it's pretty much keeping track of if this card was flipped this turn. So if this card was flipped this turn, then it can't flip. So we have to pass it in our if statement here to make sure that it's only flipping once each turn because that's what it wants. Um, so yeah, then we just do a simple, uh, we're finding the cards where here, we're finding all the cards that are villain targets and their play and making sure that if there's two or fewer, then we're going to be flipping the card to the front. And then we'll go back up here and then it's a simple reduced damage dealt to Omega. We have a nice helper here that just adds reduced damage trigger, which is going to, whenever, um, whenever this card is in play and on the front side, we will, all the damage dealt to Omega is going to be reduced by one. And then we have another end of the turn trigger. So this one, we don't actually have to end up passing a whole like five in the enumerator uh, response there because it's just going to be one, one method. So at the end of the turn, um, Omega deals hero target with the highest HP X energy damage where X equals the number of breaches in play plus one. So again, we'll be calling on a number of breaches. Um, so this one, we can just pass in our method right into here as a function right there. So we're going to be looking at deal damage to highest HP, which is what it's asking. So we're going to pass in our half helper method here. So we're getting this card and then we're putting in the number of breaches, uh, plus one, as it says here, that's where X is. And then dealing the damage type and also still passing in our trigger type because it still is a trigger. And on top of all of that, we have our, if the game is advanced. So it's pretty much if you're playing in advanced mode, then this all this code will still will be in play for that and this one is at the end of the villain turn reveal the top card of the villain deck if it is a breach put into play if not discard it shuffle the villain trash in the villain deck and omega deals each non-villain target two infernal damage so this one's doing a bunch of stuff so we're gonna have to go back down and use a method for it down here um so we're doing all that stuff we're gonna be storing the results here and then we're passing another helper method here that we use reveal card player discard it also making sure we have our link card criteria, storing the results. And so, uh, so we've revealed the top card of the villain deck. And then if it is a breach, we can we check it right here after we make sure that there are, is a card revealed, making sure that we did reveal one with store results.any, which just makes sure it's greater than zero. Um, so then we store it in was card played. And then this is just checking if it's a breach. We have all these um, Booleans here um, that just are checking like, is it a momentum? Is it a groove? Just checking if it has those keywords that it is that card. And then we're making sure it says, if it is a breach, put it into play. And then if it is not, um, discard it. So if it is not, we are going to shuffle the breach, put it into play. Yeah. Okay. And, and then we also, if it is not a breach, we also um, shuffle the villain trash into the villain deck. And Omega deals each non villain target to infernal damage. So after we go through this check, uh, we realize it's not a breach. Um, then we'll go into this code here. And then we can see another shuffle trash in the deck. And then another deal damage. Just another one of the helper methods that we have here. And it's passing the code routines for both of those as well. So that was just advanced. Just same code. It just only applies when the game is in advanced. And then when you flip the card over, we have to override a method here. So when the card flips, we have... 
uh, after flip card immediate response. So what this does, it's um, a method here that's going to be used before anything else happens on the other side. So making sure, so like this Omega here says when Omega flips to this side. So we want this to happen before any of the triggers happen on the back because it's supposed to happen because it says when this card flips to this side. So we go into this override method here after flip card response. And then, so for this card, we will be doing destroy one breach, one ongoing, one environment, one equipment card, and then Omega regains three HP for each card destroyed this way. So this one was a little different. We had to actually go through and select and destroy each card. We're, just, we're um, storing the number of cards here. So when it says he regains three HP for each card destroyed this way, we can deal all the, we can regain HP at the end. Um, and then, so we're gonna have to go through each single one, each breach, each ongoing, each environment, each equipment card. We need to select and destroy each one of those. We need to choose which one, if there are any in play. Um, so then if you did destroy, we're gonna go check for each, each one. We're gonna check if there was a card destroyed. And if there was a card destroyed, we're gonna increase this number by one. We're gonna go to the next one, the next one. We need to make sure our uh, stored results are changed for each one because we're checking different uh, select and destroys. So we have all of our different card criteria here. And then at the end of it, we're gonna have uh, all of our, we're gonna have the number here after we get how many cards were actually destroyed because we're increasing it by one each increment. And then at the end here, we use a uh, helper method here to gain HP multiple times. So pretty much what this is doing, passes in the, uh, the HP gainer, which would be uh, Omega. So after it's gonna gain HP, it's gonna gain three HP for every single one discarded. So if one was discarded, it's gonna gain HP once, gain three HP once. Say three were discarded, it's gonna gain three HP, gain three HP, gain three HP. So this is all this code is doing here, is just pretty much taking in the number of cards destroyed and then gaining HP multiple times, every single time it was destroyed. So a little bit more here to go. On the back, we also have a start of a turn action and end of the turn action. Um, this start of the turn here, we have, uh, if Omega is not flipped at the start of the turn, we have to call that again. So start of flip response. Yeah, so if it's not flipped, uh, the top card of the villain deck is played, then Omega is flipped. So this only happens if he was not was not flipped this turn. Yes. Um, so we have to go back and check this again because he's only supposed to flip once per turn. And then we're just gonna play the top card of the villain deck, just like the environment one you guys saw earlier. Pretty straightforward method right there. And then we're gonna flip the card only if it has not flipped yet. So that one's pretty straightforward there as well. And then we also just have, this one's a little bit opposite here. We also have an increase uh, damage trigger. So this one's reduced damage trigger. This one's actually increasing the damage dealt uh, to Omega. So we're pretty much just getting a deal damage action. We're sending a target to this character card. And then how much are we increasing it to? Increasing it by. So we're increasing damage dealt to one by two. And there's that there. And then we also have uh, end of the villain uh, trigger here as well. And this is just a method where it's going to add deal damage at end of the turn. Don't even need to pass a method here. It just takes it all in for us. So it's a trigger and it's also dealing damage uh, because there's a lot of cards that deal damage at the end of the turn. So this one's going to take the turn taker, the card, um, passing all the criteria that's just pretty much a deal damage method uh, or helper would call anyways. And it's just doing it all here for us. And then making sure it deals every single non-villain target here, as you can see, passed in there, uh, dealing in all energy damage. And then last but not least, we have the what happens when the game is advanced. And then exactly as I'm doing up here, we don't actually have to call a method here because it's just one friendly helper method for us that we can just put into our trigger right here. So with this, uh, we're pretty much just, it's at the end of the turn, Mega deals each, um, sorry. Oh, that's the advanced one. Uh, at the end of the turn, reveal cards from the top of the villain deck until a breach is revealed, put it into play, and discard the other cards revealed. So this helper method here we use, we just pass in the turn deck controller. Um, it's gonna be this deck, making sure we pass in that criteria. And then we're gonna be revealing until we get one match of our linked card criteria right there. And then once we get that match, it'll put that into play. And then we're gonna discard all the cards, all the other cards that we revealed on our way to get that breach. And then we also have to make sure we put in our trigger types here to um, let the trigger know what we will be doing after we call this end of turn trigger. So that might do it for me there. Cool.
those are all the cards that I will be going over today and the cards that I programmed with help of John and John Mark through the way as well. Nice. Yeah, if you're watching and you have any questions uh, about any of those things, feel free to mention in the chat or say hello. Uh, so yeah, Campbell has been working on, as you can see, all kinds of different cards from heroes to environments and villains. And um, I would say, like, you probably programmed, like, at least 80% on your own with some help yeah. from us. And then there's been yeah, some more. About, yeah. I'd say, about, yeah, but I get about 80% done. And then there's, like, a lot of stuff. Like, even just, like, wording on some cards, I don't quite know how the game works like you do. So I need a couple, like, like most of the time I use, I get some tips from you and then I kind of can get going from there, right? Yeah. Or even, you know, all those things like, uh, well, guys can do this. So let's, let's make sure we handle this strange thing that could happen because guys yeah <laughs> or like guys. or oblivion mode right like oblivion yeah. has the battle zones and the other things going on like sub decks and everything so exactly. a lot of, yeah programming it so i don't know all those like edge cases that you know off by heart so yeah sometimes i do those that's why john code reviews all my stuff yeah we still have to get a game of, of oblivion in on the tabletop here before you're yes. done we'll have yes, to we organize do. that Sure. Uh, cool. All right. So yeah, I want to show a bit of some of the more tricky stuff as well. So uh, that other 20%, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to share my display here. So you can stop sharing your screen on Skype if you want. There's, you can turn gotcha. it off. And yeah, so let's go to some interesting, I mean, Everything is interesting, but some more stuff that we kind of had to spend a lot of extra time to figure out. <laughs> um, so one thing uh, we wanted to look at was uh, the Johnny Rocket variant, which is called Maximum Speed. Um, the official name of the variant. Um, and if you're wondering, hey, variants, they're a stretch goal. Uh, and that's right, because programming them is one thing, but also you know, the programming is one part of the project, but all of the uh, resources uh, with artwork and um, all kinds of and music and other things uh, is a whole other thing. So the Kickstarter is is there to because we are hiring artists and we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of new assets created for for this game. And uh, if you can help us reach that stretch goal, we can get all that done for the variants as well. So. That is uh, hopefully going to be on on the schedule, but we did do the programming for them in any case, um, and so uh, maximum speed Johnny Rocket has some really interesting aspects to how he works that we had to 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 deal with. So the power is draw one card, shuffle up to two cards from your hand, face up into your deck. Each time one of your face up cards is on top of your deck, put it into play. Um, so if you're a fan of Sentinels of the Multiverse, you might be thinking, oh, that's just like Ambuscade. Uh, Ambuscade trap cards. So if we pull up Ambuscade deck list, uh, he has things that say face up. Uh, so rigged detonate trap. When this card is, when our play, shuffle it face up in the villain deck. Whenever this card is face up on the top of the villain deck, Ambuscade deals damage and just this card is discarded. So we do have some support already for cards being face up. Um, but we didn't we never had them in a hero deck before. And so there's some interesting interesting things related to that. Um, especially because, you know, guys can use this power. <laughs> guys can put other people's cards into his deck that don't belong to him face up and all sorts of other interesting um, scenarios can come up. And so so the basic aspect of the power, draw one card, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then we shuffle cards from your hand face up into the deck. So um, I think, where do we, yeah, we, we choose the cards and we hang on to them. Um, and we move them into our deck and we, we're calling set face up. So this doesn't, uh, usually like when we change anything in the in the game, like it's part of an action, but the face up isn't actually 
anything that is shown in the UI. So it's ca called more directly, uh, just set face up. Um, and we move it, we set the card face up and we move it into the deck. Um, and we shuffle. Um, I think we shuffle, yeah, afterwards. So there's a timing reason for this. So we move them actually onto the bottom of the deck here to make sure they're not on top. And here we're creating um, our check to see when something is face up. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, and we shuffle the cards together uh, into the deck. So up to two cards. You could pick zero, you could pick one, or you could pick two. Or maybe you could pick three if Applied Numerology is letting guys do three. Um, and we ended up having to do this as a status effect. Um, so you might think it could be a trigger, like this text here, each time one of your face-up cards is on top of your deck, put it into play, um, could be a trigger with Johnny Rocket. But the problem is that you could actually not be this character anymore. So with Completionist Guys, uh, you could imagine that you use Johnny Rocket's power a couple times. You've got some face-up cards in your deck. Then Completionist Guys switches you to regular Johnny Rocket. Well, what does that mean then if you have a card face-up on top of your deck, right? Uh, this text should still be active uh, because you use the power. It doesn't expire, right? And so it needs to be a status effect because it can actually survive this card going under guys and being not in effect anymore, at least directly in effect. So so we actually create a, we have a new kind of status effect that's looking for the top card of a deck being face up. Um, I don't think we actually use this for Ambuscade because we don't need to worry about Ambuscade not being in the game like with guys, but uh, this is used for Johnny Rocket. And um, yeah, basically this status effect is looking for um, Johnny Rocket's deck and it's expiring. Um, if if Johnny Rocket gets incapacitated, um, uh, it expires, but otherwise it doesn't. Um, and of course, if Guys is using this power, um, he can have this status effect for himself as well, because Guys. Or if, and actually, and not only that, but there's Celestial Tribunal, someone, any hero can use this power, right? So any hero can uh, use this power with Celestial Tribunal to get their face-up cards into their deck. Yeah, lots of... How long did it take for us to get through this card, Campbell? <laughs> Quite I a while. This, was this one? Yeah. Out of all? I think so. Yeah. It was. We weren't working it like consistently a couple days, but it was a good couple days at least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so... If we do, so basically this um, this status effect is firing on, I um, can't remember where we use this. It's, it's in, um, do we actually call this directly? I'm trying to, there's a place in the status effect manager where this comes up, right? Yeah. Status effect manager says, um, we're, we're creating a trigger uh, in the status effect manager, which is like outside of the card. It's part of the game itself. Here's how status effects work. And it's looking for any time we draw a card, move a card, shuffle a deck, or play a card, that could cause the top of the deck to change. And so it's looking at all of those type of actions and um, then running the response when those things happen. And then it can check to see um, is the top card face up. So here it's checks to see uh, if it's coming in as a play card action. Um, there's various timing, tricky timing elements from this. So if it's a play card action, uh, the play card, the, the trigger timing of this is before the card is played because we need to trigger this before the card's effect happens. So if you imagine there's two face up cards on top, um, the first one goes to get played, but before it actually takes effect, the next card is on top of the deck, so it needs to get played. And so, like, you can actually have a bunch of cards get played in a row 
uh, because of that. And so that's what this is doing here. Um, if it's a move card action, um, we have the trigger timing as after for this. And we put a lot of comments here because it's complicated. Uh, we look for the actual top card. Same thing with the draw card action and shuffle cards action. We just check the top card because of the timing. Uh, but with the play card, we have we have that strange timing of like the card is going to be played, but hasn't actually left the deck yet. Um, and this was tricky, very tricky to to, to sort out, of, but uh, we got it to work. And uh, yeah, we basically send a message and play the card, and you can end up chaining a bunch, uh, which is to a nice effect here. So uh, we actually have a lot of unit tests. Uh, related to this because there's many different cases. So if we look at, uh, where are we? We want heroes. Those are environments. Heroes, Johnny Rocket. So yeah, I think half of Johnny Rocket's tests are for this card. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he has his incapacity ability, but then we have a test to, you know, how does it work with completionist guys? How does it work if you're discarding, drawing? What if guys uses, I can do that too with it? Uh, what if we move the top card? Uh, what if it's not your card? Because you can put a face up card from your hand, but it doesn't have to be one of your cards, right? So for example, in Magmaria, you could have a environment card in your hand, the Smoldering Crystal, um, or you could have a card belonging to another hero in your hand if you're guys um and so that could end up going into your deck face up and it shouldn't it should stay face up on top of your deck uh but it should not get played automatically because of how this is worded uh so that's interesting um i guess that's something we'll have to think about how to show in the ui we're not doing that right now but uh yeah Interesting stuff. Um, the uh, what else do we have? So representative Earth, as I mentioned, any hero. Uh, I don't want this results window. What's that? Uh, Show source code. So like this is saying, I think yeah, Bowman is using maximum speed Johnny Rocket character's power, and so it needs to work in that case. Uh, it needs to work with reward cards, which are kind of unusual because they are double sided. Uh, but they do count as your cards once you earn them. So that's another case that we need to deal with. Uh, handle shuffling the deck. And if, you know, if the top card after shuffling is, uh, is face up, we need to play it. And yeah, what if there's two in a row cards face up? And for some of these, we just set the random seed of the game to make sure that when we shuffle, we end up with the, the two cards on top. Um, that's a, a way we can do that without having to do more intricate shenanigans to control the shuffle. So yeah, that was that ended up being uh, probably a couple of weeks to sort of think about all the different things and work on them here and there. Um, and I'm sure there are still some edges to it that we haven't figured out. But that's why we do a lot of testing and we get uh, things into beta testing and uh, and people will be uh, trying it out and even then when it goes out into the world then you start getting you know thousands of people playing thousands of games uh, and trying things that we never even could have thought of so yeah should be interesting to see what people do with uh, maximum speed Johnny Rocket so that was one of the um, unusual things we looked at um, there are two other really interesting uh, cards that took us some extra time. So uh, let's take a look at Dr. Metropolis' controlled demolition. So under hero decks, I'll pull up Dr. Metropolis. And he has a card called controlled demolition that says uh, each time an environment card is destroyed or reduced to zero or fewer HP, Dr. Metropolis may deal himself two psychic damage. If he's dealt damage this way, treat that card as having no game text. So that's something that we never had to do before, was treat a card as having no game text. 
Uh, we've had things like, you know, um, we often have to do things like when a card's being destroyed, it doesn't get to do anything and stuff like that. But specifically, you know, this sentence here does not appear in Sentinels of the Multiverse. Uh, like, no game text. I guess there is a little bit like when cards are underneath cards. So cards underneath, under this card have no game text. So, but generally that's handled by things saying, you know, cards under cards have no game text, period. Same thing with entry point. Card under this card has no game text. Um, that's a little different because that's sort of just like based on the state of where the card is, whereas this is a seemingly temporary effect, right? So the, the curious thing about this is like, well, the environment card's destroyed or reduced to zero or fewer. Treat the card as having no game text. So, but it's going to get destroyed, right? Um, or reduced to zero or fewer. So what if it's indestructible? So this comes up in Farside City. So let's look at Farside City. It's kind of a really clever interaction, I think. Under Farside City, we have Preserver Artifacts that say on them, this card is indestructible and they have hit points. So, you know, they can go to minus whatever hit points and they won't be destroyed. But if controlled demolition uh, is in play, this indestructible card can get reduced to zero or fewer. And then Dr. Metropolis could say, I deal myself two psychic damage. So I treat the card as having no game text, which means this card doesn't say indestructible. It just becomes a blank card with zero HP. And so then it can be destroyed. So that's the kind of interesting combination that that has. Uh, one thing that I believe we do have a question outstanding to Christopher is, what if something else makes the card indestructible? <laughs> and I believe that is something that, yeah, what's the interaction with fixed point uh, with this? Because fixed point um, says, all cards are indestructible. And so if we had some other card be reduced to zero of your HP, that card would have no game text. But how long does that effect last? That's something that we're not really super sure on. So we're going to be asking Christopher the details about that. So there's a few edge cases around those things. Um, and other cards we have edge cases around that, uh, that we're going to be talking to Christopher about, uh, as we always do. Um, so yeah, so I don't know why, yeah, Freedom Tower, that was for entry point. So let's look at controlled demolition in the code and see what we worked out for that. So, so yeah, so we've got, we had to add a new kind of uh, thing, which was making a card blank, even when it's not, you know, underneath another card. Um, and we also have to intercept prevented destruction. So let's, let's get into that. So, so each time an environment card is destroyed or reduced to zero or fewer, we add a trigger on destroy card action, right? Which is going to cover each time an environment card is destroyed. Oh, I heard a, a strange sound in my headphones, but I think it's fine. Are you still there, Campbell? Oh, I'm still here, but I heard, I'm still here, but I heard your sound go all. It feels like more clear. <laughs> I think it might be me. My, how about now, Campbell? Yeah. Yeah, my headphones just turned off on, the, on their own for some reason. Oh. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, I'm hearing strange noises, but it's X, X, <laughs> Xbox noises. <laughs> uh, anyways. I'm not hearing those, so that's... Yeah, I think they're just coming from my headset, just to me. Okay. Uh, all right, so if it's an environment card being destroyed... Um, and yeah or yeah it's blah 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 different different checks here and we're basically looking to this other extra check is saying we haven't already made it blank or inhibited it here we don't want to like duplicate our triggers there um we call this destroy response um and 
Similarly, if uh, the hit points after being dealt damage are less than or equal to zero, uh, we have a similar trigger, the damage response. Both of them do the same thing. They We have to have one response method that takes a destroy card action, one that, that takes a deal damage action. They both go to this common response, which all, all it cares about is the environment card and um, should we add the inhibitor to it. So if he um, does actually deal, he gets a chance to decide if he wants to deal the damage. If he does and he actually takes damage, um, we will add an inhibitor, uh, which essentially, if something has an inhibitor on it, um, it prevents that card controller from doing anything at all. Uh, and that's typically used for when a card is being destroyed. Uh, it gets an inhibitor, so it doesn't get to perform any actions. Um, and as this documentation says, don't call this, but this is a case where we do call it because uh, it's needed. But generally, it shouldn't be used uh, most of the time, but this is a case where we do need to use it. Uh, and we also record it in a property, so that's this inhibited card property. But the triggers here are just making sure that we don't try to do it twice on the same card. And so once we've done that, now this, you know, having uh, adding the inhibitor and recording this property are what we're going to need to for everything else to to know if the card is blank or if the card should be uh, prevented and so on. So so we we tell the game controller uh, we want to be on the list of things that get asked about. Do you make cards blank? And uh, if we yeah, so this one is was interesting. So if we're treating the card as having no game text and uh, the card makes itself indestructible, say no. What does, I'm trying to remember what that means. <laughs> um, yeah, how did that come into play? I can't remember exactly. Um, yeah. We're, you're, we're basically saying, like, if the card that we inhibited... I'm not sure why this is say no. I, yeah, maybe the comment is inaccurate here. But if it's the card that we chose here, then we're going to say, yes, the card is blank. Um, and we can also uh, see if we should intercept the prevented destruction. Right, okay, yeah, I, I remember. Because those cards... So the card, for example... Uh, we have our environment deck here. So if we look at far side manufactory, the thing is, uh, the making indestructible uses these lists as well. And so this card is always going to say, yeah, I'm indestructible. I'm always indestructible. And so the things that are the, the code that is asking about this needs to be able to, uh, ask, hey, do you, should we actually ignore that card telling me that it's indestructible? So you can kind of work yourself into a corner with all the logic puzzles uh, with these things. Uh, but yeah, so um, here, if the card says it's indestructible, we can say, actually, no, uh, we made it blank. So it should be destructible and not indestructible. Um, and if we look at who calls this ask if card is blank, um, Basically, uh, yeah, I guess card controller. And when is this used? Uh, right, yeah, so anytime we actually, this ask all card controllers in list is used for a lot of different things. And if it, the first thing we do is ask if the card is blank. And if it is, we don't actually call it the ask method. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of tricky. Basically, if, you know, we have this me mechanism of asking cards like, hey, are you indestructible? Hey, you know, do you make this other card indestructible or whatever? And so we sort of have, have to, this has made us have to add um, a way to intercept in advance and say, no, you don't actually ask that card anything, it's blank. Um, so that's one, one way to stop it from doing things. And the other way is to inhibit it, which cancels any actions it would do. Um, so yeah, so lots of tricky stuff. Um, and intercepting the prevented destruction, I believe, comes through with, yeah, should we 
Uh, return a card to that should be executed if the card would be destroyed, but isn't going to be because it's indestructible. Yeah, so we do that. If any controller card control under your scepter, it wouldn't actually be destroyed. So yeah, we we do all these funny things. Uh, and so this took us... I'm not sure how long it took us to do this one. Um, and it's still probably not done because of edge cases that we have to ask Christopher about. But it was one of the ones that we actually uh, made a, brand, a separate branch to work on for a while. Um, just for, you know, just for that stuff. I think, yeah, it was a... A, a couple of weeks at least to go through all the different uh, situations there. Um, and yeah, I would say I'm, we're, I'm probably like 90% sure that it's going to work in most of the cases. <laughs> There's going to be some cases where it's not going to work where over where, not where, where things are going to be even more tricky. But again, similar to the um, Johnny rocket, we have a lot of unit tests. Uh, I guess we have three, three unit tests for it, uh, but there's going to be probably some more when we get back from Christopher, or hear back from Christopher about some questions. Um, so we test it uh, with destroying uh, an environment card directly. Um, so for example, we uh, destroy the volcanic eruption in Insul Permalis, uh, which will would uh, deal damage, right? So, or actually it wouldn't deal damage, it would uh, put an obsidian field into play. So if we look at uh, volcanic eruption, it says when this card is destroyed, move the obsidian fields from the trash into play. Um, so we put one in the trash and we destroy it, but we use this effect to treat it as having no game text. And so uh, the obsidian field does not come into play. But then if we play a different copy, you know, if we play eruption again, uh, we can interfere, but we can also, uh, you know, we get to, tre it's treated as a separate uh, instance of the card, like normal in Sentinels. Um, now we also have a test for reducing something to zero or fewer HP. This is this is for the uh, Far Side City uh, cards, the Preserver artifacts, um, like we talked about earlier. So yeah, so uh, it makes it no longer indestructible, so it gets destroyed. Um, and playing it again, it continues to be indestructible. We can make sure our tracking logic works uh, over multiple turns. Uh, and then we also, it has just a power that destroys an environment card. So that's pretty straightforward. So that's uh, another one of the tricky cards from Earth Prime. Any comments on that, Campbell? <laughs> no, that one was mostly John. I looked at it and I was like, I have no idea what's going on. Put it away. Put it away. <laughs> bit and then talk to John about it and kind of just watched him do his thing when he went through all like dove deeper into the code and stuff over that one. Yeah, there's definitely uh, a lot of, you know, going into the guts of how the game works. Um, yeah. Like treating a card as having no game text, right, is 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 a lot, I think, in, in this, especially since it's not been done before. Um, and then let's pull up one more. And that is Unshackled Resilience uh, from Lady Liberty. So I'll pull up Lady Liberty's deck here as well. And this is another really interesting one. So all, all, most of her cards are pretty straightforward. And then she has this card that's like totally strange. So... You cannot be prevented from playing cards using powers or drawing cards. Damage dealt by Lady Liberty cannot be prevented. Um, so that's, you know, one of the rules of Sentinels is can't beats can. And so, you know, it's quite common to say you cannot do this. You cannot play cards. You cannot deal damage. But this, you know, this is a cannot that trumps that cannot. It says you cannot be prevented from playing cards. I think I might have... Oh, no, I just heard another sound, but I think that wasn't me. Yeah, I can still hear you, Campbell. Good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's lots of things that say you can't deal damage, you can't use powers, you can't draw cards. And this is the first... It's not the first, but it's the first ongoing card that is saying you cannot, cannot. Um, there is an example already of Freedom 5 legacies in capabilities that say 
it's a it's a one-time thing so one hero can play a card now even if they'd be otherwise prevented use a power then the same thing for power and same thing for draw a card so what these do is they you know they basically say uh we're gonna allow you to do this this one time and then it you know clears that it says we can't it can be canceled false so like it's just this one time thing um And so that like lets you know someone play one card or draw use one power or draw one card. But this lets you, you know, as long as this card is in play, it's having that effect. Um, so it's uh, quite a different animal. Um, as well as damage dealt cannot be prevented, that's also uh, a new thing. And then we have a few more, you know, you might be wondering, well, what about all the different wordings of prevent? What does that exactly mean? Immune to damage or this sort of thing those are questions we have into christopher as well that we'll be asking him about the exact edge cases of all those things uh, because that's what we like to do is have things work uh, exactly right according to what christopher wants um so this is another case like controlled demolition of a lot of double negatives so uh you know this card is on the list of cards that can cancel preventing um and so uh you know asking that now we have this method ask if any card can prevent an action and we say uh if it's this hero this turn taker controller and it's play card action use power draw a card deal damage it cannot be prevented so we return false no card can prevent that action um so that's from the ask side of things and then we also uh set up triggers for canceling um so we cancel the cancel actions, basically. So things that will prevent card plays, say if we pl go to like, you know, this is villain card play, or maybe Megalopolis has stuff, right? Like um, Operazzi on the scene. Let's pull that card up. So it calls this thing cannot use powers, which is a helper method, because it's pretty common for that to be a thing. Um, it sets up, um, uh, a list thing about can using powers and it also has this cannot perform action which i believe ends up setting yes ends up setting cancel triggers cancels uh decisions around using powers cancels actually using the power prevents the phase action which means like um uh so when you go to your use power phase you get to use one power, right? Or maybe you get to use two because you have the legacy ring. So this just sets the number of powers you can use in your power phase to zero and so on. So there's like, there's a lot of logic around making sure that you can't actually use a power if you're not supposed to be able to use a power. And this card needed to make a way to get around all of those ways that we try to stop you from doing the things. And so it's kind of interesting that like, you know, we had a lot of code trying to make sure that you, you would not be able to play a card by any means or use a power by any means or draw a card by any means or deal damage by any means. And now we have to sort of go and find a way to undo that, but only while this card is being played. So here we're canceling the cancels um, and we're canceling uh, the prevent phase action. We're canceling the, we're, if, if something tries to set the phase action count to zero, we cancel that. Um, if something tries to cancel our damage, we cancel that as well. Um, and then the power is just really simple. So, uh, so there's this, but then you can even see when we were looking into this helper function around cannot perform action, there's some code in here uh, that was checking, you know, like, oh, like, if this hero can't use powers, let's just not even bother asking them which power, because why would, you know, it'd be really annoying if you can't use powers, if the game was like, well, choose a power to use and like, oh, ho, jokes on you, you can't use the power. So we sort of shortcut things when you can't use powers. So we don't even show those decisions. But then with Unshackled Resilience, we have to say, oh, actually, uh, we need to check to see, <laughs> can we, are we actually allowed? Uh, and so, as we note here, Unshackled Resilience is, is popping up there in the comments as well uh, for select card, for select turn taker. Um, 
and that sort of thing. So lots of things going on with Uncheckled Resilience. And of course, uh, just like the others, this has a number of different edge cases to deal with in terms of unit testing. Uh, a lot of tests for Uncheckled Resilience. Uh, we've got, you know, for each type of thing, draw, play, power, and damage, um, well, use power, yeah, the power itself is pretty simple. There's sort of three ways that these things can happen. So if you're playing a card, um, you could play a card by, yeah, I think direct trigger is the cancel, cancel method. So uh, it covers things like hero cards cannot be played, like hostage situation. So that card just, it's a trigger, right? While hostage situation is in play, hero cards cannot be played. That's all there is to it. Um, if you destroy a hostage situation, you can play cards again. So this test is covering that kind of mechanism. Uh, but then we also have status effects, right? So you could you could play Mist Bound from Night Mist and say cards from that deck may not be played until the start of your turn. And that doesn't need, Mist Bound is a one shot, right? That goes away. Um, and so that's a different mechanism of preventing card plays that Lady Liberally needs to overcome. Um, and then again, as I mentioned with the phase action trigger, moving to your play card phase, normally the game, you know, if hostage situation is in play, we try to go to your play card phase, it's gonna say, well, we'll just skip your play card phase because you can't play a card. Um, and so, uh, but with Unshackled Resilience, uh, it's not skipped. We do get to go to your play card phase. And we also combine it with the status effect because that was, I guess, a tricky, tricky combination as well. Uh, and yeah, same thing with these power draw cards. They all have different kind of triggers that can stop them in different ways. Block the plank or uh, paparazzi on the scene or their combinations and so on. And yeah, dealing damage, uh, I think we have, yeah, we have a couple different things here. Uh, so we have, um, yeah, the typical prevented damage. So, uh, so one here is Freak Show from Madame Mittermeyers. This is based on a trigger. Uh, so Freak Show says the target with the hero target with the lowest HP cannot deal damage, which is a trigger based mechanism. So, uh, that, you know, we test that it, that it works normally and then it doesn't work or it, it allows the damage to go through if Unshackled Resilience is in play. Um, we also have prevent damage dealt by that target as a status effect, like with Throat Jab. So if you hit Lady Liberty with Throat Jab, uh, Unshackled Resilience will still work uh, and allow you to deal damage. And then we have, I believe combat timing is, yeah, prevent that damage. Um, so we can hit La Commodora, which is a hero target, but whatever, uh, prevent that damage. We could go with something else, but that is just the same as anything else. If she would be dealt three or more damage, prevent that damage, uh, and that wouldn't be prevented because Unjackled Resilience says damage cannot be prevented. Um, so yeah, a couple things that are outstanding are, are things that we're gonna ask Christopher about, like what about immune to damage? Um, does that count um, and things like that? So we'll be, you know, working out all those little edge cases as well. So yeah, lots of testing and lots of lots of interesting stuff in some of the more complex areas of Earth Prime as well. Um, I'm sure there's a few more that uh, we didn't cover today, but uh, you'll be seeing them in the game. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure more will come up, especially with the mini expansion content that hopefully we'll get to with the stretch goals. So just to cover that again, um, make sure to check out the Kickstarter. I'm gonna paste a link into the chat again in case anyone is new and didn't see that yet in the chat. Uh, we have stretch goals for um, the Magical Mysteries pack, which has uh, four more decks, two heroes, an environment, and a villain. Uh, we also need a letter I there, apparently. <laughs> um, and um, that is going to be uh, part of the Kickstarter edition. Uh, if you pledge at that level, it's included, or it'll be a separate purchase uh, if you don't. And then the next stretch goal after that is the variance, as I mentioned. Uh, we've got um, 
one variant for each hero that we need to make the artwork for and program and test all those cards and and do all those things and so uh we need your help to get to that stretch goal and make that happen and uh yeah you can see some more examples of the great artwork um on this update as well so uh yeah any other thoughts on any of those cards and interactions campbell no i think you did a good job going over them those are some tricky ones so those are mostly you so you did cool. a good job yeah. yeah well hopefully i'm sure there's <laughs> more lurking things lurking in the shadows <laughs> good start <laughs> with start. guys yeah exactly yeah. uh so yeah so that today has been a bit of a, a deep dive into the you know the logic and the rules programming uh of earth prime um and we're going to be looking probably next week uh to do another dev stream where we go into some more of the user interface uh elements so uh, how do we uh you know get the cards of earth prime to show up in the the different way like you know you can see they look quite different from uh sentinels of the multiverse cards uh, both for the regular cards and the character cards, and especially the villain cards are, you know, a wide format instead of in Sentinels, they're like a portrait format. So we've been working on getting those uh, uh, into the game, uh, as well as um, probably some of the other UI changes that we are uh, working on for uh, the standalone version of Sentinels of Earth Prime. So lots of fun stuff to come. Um, and, but that's going to do it for today. I think we've been here for about an hour and a half and that's a pretty good dev stream length. How's your first dev stream there, Campbell? Great. No, I had a good time. Nice. Uh, cool. So, so yeah, if you are interested in more dev streams, please, uh, feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube. This is going to be up as, as well, or on the Kickstarter, you can post some comments and let us know what you think. Uh, make sure to visit the Kickstarter and take a look, and we'll see you all next time. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Have a good one, guys. Sentinels of Earth Prime is an all-new standalone game set in the world of the critically acclaimed Mutants and Masterminds role-playing game, and built on the rules of Sentinels of the Multiverse. Play as heroes of the Freedom League, fighting back against an array of dastardly foes from Earth Prime and beyond. Featuring ten outstanding heroes, four insidious villains, and four immersive environments local co-op and online multiplayer.